thank you to all the attendees and participants for you know for participating from the one until now. We're, we're very grateful for your time. It's good to have people come to you know academic events, even when they're so boring sometimes. But uh, these boring conversations are the reason why we are you know doing the work that we do as thinkers. So this session is on the project and the practice and it's focusing on the challenge of curriculum, um, but especially in the South African context, but also you know, widely in the, in the African context. Um, and I want to start by saying that South Africa really occupies a unique position um, in the decolonial project in the continent, beginning from the Roots Must Fall movement and the recent um, uh, fees must fall protests against uh, fee increases in the higher education system. But these protests have um, morphed into further calls for, for decolonial, for a decolonial university, decolonial higher education, decolonial teaching and learning, and really other structural issues on the on the in the in the in in, in the academy or in, in, in academia. So uh, our focus in this session is to to foreground our role as media, communication, and journalism um, educators and, and, and um, teachers and trainers and mentors and students, our role in this uh, decolonial project, just to, to have a sense of a clear-sighted and critical perspective of what, what we should be doing in teaching and learning. Um, and I just want to say that decolonization which is the project, as far as this, the topic of this session is about, is the project, which is decolonization or decoloniality, invites us to, I think it invites us to, to the link from the epistemologies of the West or the global North, or, um, and to go against the grain of normalized and routinized and taking for granted modes of uh, knowledge transmission, knowledge production and reproduction, consumption and dissemination. And I'm, I'm really struck by what Francis Inyam just said um, in his article in 2019, where he was writing about decolonizing the university in Africa. He says that most, univers most universities in post-colonial Africa have significantly Africanized their personnel. However, they have been less, less successful in Africanizing their curricula their pedagogical structures and epistemologies, despite declarations of, of intent and attempts at decolonization of university education through promotion of perspectives grounded in African realities and experiences. So beyond the declarations of intent and attempts, you know, small pockets of intent here and there that we see in the whole decolonization of university education, we still have a lot of work to do. And as media educators, media communication and journalism educators and, and scholars and researchers, what is our role? And, and, and so that's why this, this, this panel uh, is important because all the presentations that we're going to hear this, this afternoon are really geared towards bringing it back home to our disciplinary home um, to show us how we must deal with defining a new epistemic identity for ourselves in order to, uh, to, 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 to make better our media and journalism education, training and production. And so I'm, I'm privileged to chair this session. My name is Chikezia Uzebunam, and we have four really great panelists who are going to be talking to us. They are different, but very interconnected uh, uh, topics. First of all, we have, so we have four, presenter, uh, four presenters and each of them coming from different universities. Each of them are going to talk to us for 15 minutes and then we'll have Q&A at the end. So I'm going to introduce the first uh, panelists. Um, Dr. Sandra Pitcher is um, a senior lecturer from UKZN and uh, she's presenting a work that she's done with Dr. Nicola Jones, associate professor at UKZN. And they will be discussing what they have titled decolonizing and Africanizing. Um, <clears throat> discussing current challenges of curriculum development in a South African university uh, journalism program. And we'll also hear from Mr. Mankete Mixin Sinong, who is a lecturer at University of Limpopo, who will be talking about the impact of decolonization of journalism curriculum, looking at journalism programs at higher education institutions in South Africa. We'll also hear from Ms. Tarin De Vega, our own um, lecturer here, 
at the school, um, who will be talking about the coloniality, the relevance and curricula today. And finally, we'll hear from Professor Zandi Carol Lesame, uh, who's from UNISA, but I believe, I don't know if she's still affiliated to, uh, to University of Limpopo, but she'll be talking about teaching and learning the colonial approaches in journalism practice. So you're welcome and thank you for, for coming and for really preparing to, to be part of this panel. So first of all, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Sandra Pitcher and then we'll take it from there. Thank you. Just use the, okay, cool. Morning, everyone. It's still morning. Um, can you all hear me at the back? Just check. Great. So this essentially this paper came out of a discussion um, that kind of was driven after the fees must fall um, issues. Um, and we all know kind of the story behind that. Um, and the reality is that as was as was brought up by our chair, that apartheid fell almost 30 years ago, and the majority of our institutions really have tick boxes to transform. Um, and, and really what we've found is that, and I'm, I'm quoting um, Adora Hoppers here, that we've seen a change of color of face rather than a total mindset in our curriculum. And when fees must fall happened, um, there, were, there were questions that started to be asked, what have we done? Um, why is it that we still have very Eurocentric um, and thus very alienating curriculum for, for students in South Africa? Um, and Additionally, the non-apologetic display of colonial figures um, that were very hurtful to, to many um, students and to the majority of South Africans. And obviously, because of, of the University of Cape Town, um, it was that, that statue of Cecil John Rhodes that kind of kicked off those protests. However, yeah, that's what I was worried about. Which, yeah. Okay. So... Yes, the fees must fall. Protests did bring to life these this dissatisfaction. I quite like that picture of roads covered in in black bags and taped up. But the reality is, is that this discussion didn't start at UCT. Um, they probably like to think that it started with them. Vitz likes to think it started with them. But in actual fact. If you look at a lot of the previously black universities in South Africa, the University of Fort A, Fort A Walter Sisulu University, the University of Durban Westville that became part of UKZN, we have been having these types of struggles for decades. These are nothing new, and they have been calling for reform to fees, reform to curriculum, to decolonize, and to move away from these Eurocentric things. This just kind of put it on the map, and I think it also speaks to what was spoken about yesterday, the problem of, of journalism being a very gatekeepy <laughs> type of profession. And it was the reality is, is that it was only when the mainstream media picked it up because the prominent universities, the best universities, started making a fuss. The rest of us were, it didn't matter because it was, it was noise. But when they took it over, um, it became something that we all had to start thinking about. Um, the problem is, is that since we've kind of dealt with this and, and the fees must fall movements happened, is that it's become, to decolonize has actually become a bit of a stalled exercise on many university campuses. And part of that problem is because there hasn't been much consensus between students, activists, university administrators, government, in terms of what it means to decolonize, what does it mean to Africanize, um, and how do we actually start doing this? So this is kind of where we, we, where we found ourselves. Um, and we started to question, well, how could we change our journalism program to start discussing these types of, of issues? Um, mm -hmm. And essentially what we decided to do is to try to consider what decolonization meant as a starting point. Now, we kind of, <laughs> I kind of put this on two sides, um, and these are kind of the things that we, that that kind of where there are some issues and ones that I think are possibly offering a bit more of a useful way of, of approaching this, um, because what some people have have argued, um, and especially with the extreme activists in South Africa, is that the the whole point of decolonization is to rid the system, whether it's educational or political, of any colonial elements. And 
the reality is this is kind of problematic, um, not just because we are multicultural in South Africa and in Africa, but also the fact that colonial elements have kind of crept into all sorts of different cultures. Um, and we can see even in, in our language um, and the, 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 the way in which people speak in South Africa, <clears throat> the indigenous languages have been brought in um, and they kind of borrow from different places, different um, dialects, they borrow from different customs. The, um, the, the impact of Christianity has obviously played a huge part um, and very much Western Christianity um, has played a big part of this. I know that um, the whole idea of afri ethics is, is kind of founded in Catholicism, um, which in itself is a little bit problematic. So that's the first issue. The other one is that if we're just going to replace one system with another, and I think it was brought up earlier, sort of if Zulu becomes the dominant language, the dominant culture, then we're replacing it. We're just replacing one system of power with another one. Um, so what we kind of point out here is that perhaps when we talk about decolonization, um, we should take on a trans-traditional vantage point. And what we mean by that is that if we're going to look at decolonized ed educational curricula, um, we need to be cognizant of other knowledge systems, um, whether they be European, Asian, or Africa. And we should be trying to integrate all of these different things um, and inform it through local knowledge production. So we, we kind of offer up that type of point. Um, and what that kind of then helps to do is that it can be integrated um, many of the issues that sort of face decolonized countries is that and and the indigenous um, systems is that we then become less reliant on these other knowledge systems we use it to inform our own way of thinking and so decolonization is not about a sort of attempt to sort of to revive and reinstate these ideals um, that we actually don't know about as Rod pointed out because what was it before colonization and and all of that type of, of issue but it's what we're trying to do is we also have to think about the impact of modernity and industrialization um, and how do we how do we find something like that so all of this kind of brings about how do we design an Africanized curricula um, and Yes, there are all sorts of different issues about what it means to be African, and I, I'm not going to go into that because we could be here for the next 20 years. Um, but what we sort of saying is that if we sort of what we need to do is we we need to to avoid two of the pitfalls of of the Africanization argument, and that is firstly we have to acknowledge that all Africans are not the same. We can't kind of put everyone lumped in and it's a one homogenous group. Um, if we do that, it's then it's just going to, again, we're going to create one power structure with another and favor one power situation for another. So what I've kind of, what we've kind of spoken about is how do we look at things like Ubuntu um, and social responsibility theory and how does that inform our journalism program? So, I think what we must understand is that in South Africa, um, we we tend to run on a liberal framework of journalism. Um, and that's really because of the history of the country coming from a British system. Um, but the problem is with that libertarian framework, it's a very individualistic one. And as Rod kind of pointed out in the last session, we find that in local communities, they are very collectivist and very communitarian driven. And that's really what Ubuntu is, is about. So what I would sort of, what's kind of been argued here is that um, yes, after apartheid, it was great that we had this libertarian framework in, in place because it helped um, media institutions try to kind of keep watchdog of the government um, to keep them, to, to hold them accountable during apartheid and then after apartheid. But the problem here is that when we, when we deal with that, we end up with this hegemonic struggle um, about sort of essentialist categor categorizations of what it means to be Western and African. So what we kind of, what kind of argue here is that we do need to protect our press freedom in South Africa, which is very much a Western way of looking at it, um, as it kind of came out of, of, a, of a British li uh, libertarian model. But also that 
we have to understand what the government and the people want as well. And it has been quoted quite often by the ANC that they really want uh, journalists to sort of understand that their role is to help develop a de de developmental state. There should be collective rights. Um, we need to have values of caring and sharing, Ubuntu, non-sexism, and working together. Um, and the reality is, is that at the moment, our press is driven by very neoliberalist approaches. So what we kind of argue is that as South Africa has developed, and since sort of the end of apartheid, and we've now essentially ended up with a de, de facto one-party state, um, we need to start moving away from this developmental role to a liberal democratic view. Um, but the and and sort of this is where we see the press now has become this self-elected opposition party to the one-party state. But I think it's really important that we now start looking at issues of Ubuntu and how does that fit in with this? Um, how, how do we deal with that that um, conflict between this individualist watchdog role and and an Ubuntu role that the that the government is calling for, uh, for. Now, this is possibly where I'm going to make people mad. <laughs> is the way that the government tends to use Ubuntu. So they really like to sort of say it expresses compassion, uh, dignity, harmony, humanity. Um, it creates community of justice and mutual caring. Wonderful. The problem is, is that most politicians kind of leave it there and they don't actually go into what is the what are the real roots of Ubuntu they don't really want to admit that um, Ubuntu is is more about an inclusive community where the community as a whole is represented by the individuals that constitute it rather than protecting the dignity of an individual so it's perfectly fine to go after or to hold somebody accountable if it is the will of the community, and this is achieved through consensus through the community. Um, so the, the Ubuntu media system is one that gives everyone and anyone a platform to discuss social issues, um, because it really is there about recognizing humanity can only be attained through how one relates to other people and their surroundings. So I think what we need to kind of remember is that the other thing is that Ubuntu also embraces the idea of adjusting positions, adjusting your framework, your references based on what others have said and done and learning from. It's not set in stone. Um, and it's it's very much a, a communitarian framework, which through discussion and understanding um, is where we kind of decide what the ethics are. And I mean, even if we go back to um, Siebert's Four Theories of the Press, which so many of us learn at undergrad, and it's kind of this seminal text. When they wrote that, they said, you know what, this the world is going to change. The world has changed. And yet we're still teaching this. This is our foundational seminal text, but we've done nothing really to move away from it. Um, and in fact, as I said, um, Siebert quite rightly pointed out in 1956, that the, the press takes on the form and coloration of the social and political structures within with it within which it operates. Um, and yeah. And so we can't actually, <laughs> we can't just keep it the way it was. We have to expand our theories. We have to think about things from different points of view. We have to look at the social and political structures at a specific time and adjust as we, we build along. So, yeah, I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to jump quickly to the issue of the students because I think that's where we're going. So we've kind of used all these ethical theories um, about what to do and how to do it. But the problem is, is that it's not so simple to put into practice. It's all nice and easy and in theory. Um, but it is quite challenging because one of the things is at UKZN, um, we have students who arrive, unlike many other universities like UCT and BITS, um, where all this, these issues work, we have students who arrive that have never seen a computer before. They don't even know how to turn a computer on. Now, 
we have, and it drives me nuts because university management seems to think, give them a computer and they just know how to use it, which is, I mean, it's, which is ridiculous. Um, but the thing is, is that we aren't adapting our programs to the technology that our students know how to use. And I've taken this picture of one of my old students um, with this permission, <laughs> but it's this thing of using mobile media. That's the big thing that we need to start embracing in our classrooms and learning from our students how they use it and integrate that. Yes, of course, we still have to teach them the reading and writing and the, the, the conventions of journalism that is needed in the in the, in the working world. But as was said in the previous session, we need to be multimedia focused, multimedia driven. And a lot of that is done through um, mobile phones and mobile platforms. And that is kind of where we've started to, to build on this. And then obviously we've started to build on not just um, teaching them the, the Western tradition of ethics that's used all over the world, um, or at least in the Western world, but also the South African approach. Teach our students respect, teach them about social responsibility, um, and show them uh, exactly how these African-centered philosophies um, can actually be used alongside these Western ones, and how it can actually inform the, the ways that we're doing it, and, and making them understand that they are the change that we've got to see. Um, because at the moment, most of the staff, and coming back to what I started with, is with that tick box. We've changed the color, or we've transformed in terms of color and gender. But the majority of those individuals were trained in the old-fashioned Eurocentric ways. So that's what they know. So it's about learning from our students to teach us and giving them the power to take it forward. Um, yeah, and kind of develop their own ideas about the journalism program and empower them to do so. Sorry, that was very rushed <laughs> Been all over the place. Thank you. So next we're going to hear from, from Mankete. Okay. My name is Mankete. I'm an investor of Pumbopos, Department of Media, Communication and Information Studies. I'm there serving as a lecturer for media and journalism modules. My presentation is on the impact of decolonization of journalism curricula. It's an analysis of journalism programs at institutions of higher learning in South Africa. So the reason why I picked up or decided to make a presentation on this idea is simply because I've realized just how important it is that universities, particularly those that are offering fully fleshed journalism programs or qualifications, start to decolonize their programs in order for the current crop of journalists or student journalists or journalism students to come out of the system, not only having acquired the practicalities of journalism, but also having had or acquired necessary knowledge around the theories or theoretical basis of um, African concepts, African journalism, Afroethics, and also mastered the theories that, that, that are critically important in decolonization or Africanization of uh, journalism practice. So that's the outline of my presentation. That we're going to look at the introduction and background, objective of study, the role of theory, literature, methodology, findings, recommendations, conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, you will allow me not to spend much time on any of the slides because I've got about 20, 20 presentation, 20 slide presentation. So I'll quickly run through them. So this paper espouses a case to decolonize journalism education by integrating diversity and inclusion into journalism content, journalism curriculum, thereby decolonizing academic content as a path towards enabling every student that has enrolled for journalism is either a degree or a full degree or an elective to be educated on the importance of multiculturalism, multilingualism, and also race relations in communities. So journalism education is considered to shape the way journalists 
undertake their journalistic practices and also apply their required the required skills that they shall have learned through the university education system. So this research studied module descriptions on South African on seven South African universities um, through the um, you know the, the modules made available through the institutional websites. I also looked at the the listing the listing of the ratings or study materials that these universities have enlisted as part of their teaching and learning programs. So my attention was to look as to whether or not these very universities that have sampled for this study, whether they are offering um, African languages or indigenous languages as part of their journalism programs. So the previous studies that were undertaken looked also at the study materials offered in journalism programs, particularly in the global north, and found that most of the readings that have been prescribed for the study programs in journalism are based on the writings um, developed by the authors that are based in the global north. This is something that is not um, foreign to us. Um, some of our journalism programs prescribe textbooks or study materials, or even academic um, journal articles that were sourced from the authors based in the global north, which do not necessarily reflect on our lived experiences as both the lecturers and also the students. Next slide, please. <coughs> So the previous research, I think this one is okay. The previous research on the study materials offered in journalism programs globally found that authors in the global north were preferred, and even the case studies um, as part of the teaching and learning in journalism programs were Eurocentric or Western oriented or Western focused, and also the you know that also filtered into their journalistic storytelling. Uh, which is something that um, you and I have uh, fallen in love with. Um, pretty much what goes into our teaching and also how we practicalize the theoretical component is uh, shaped by the, the Western-based knowledge systems. So this kind of culture privileges this practice and position that's universal. So this over-reliance or over-dependence of the foreign-oriented, Western-oriented, um, the journalism method, uh, teaching methodologies and practice uh, tends to overshadow the ability of our very own uh, academics in developing our student journalists in as far as um, telling the African stories, uh, the, the best way the African community uh, may tend to understand them. So the universities in the Global South import study materials such as book, books, DVDs, and software uh, without merit to educate our students or their students. The reason why this appears to be important is simply because we tend to look at the West as, as the main purveyors of knowledge. And when it comes to journalism, we tend to really you know, focus or tap into what they offer and how they offer that which they offer, despite the fact that our communities may not um, have interest in the type of news that we produce, um, given the fact that we shall, we shall not have um, um, addressed or prioritized their interest in the gathering, production, and also dissemination of the information. So the objective of the study, is to analyze the impact of decolonization of journalism curricula at institutions of higher learning. So my study looked at VETS, TUT, UJ, no, VETS, TUT, UJ, yes, um, Stellenbosch University, uh, Deben University of Te Technology, and also Rhodes University. So what are the theories that we can use as part of decolonizing or Africanizing journalism curricula? 
in the global south. We've got three theories, decoloniality, critical race theory, and also um, colorism. So these are the theories that have been used, uh, relied upon by decolonial scholars in countries such as Ecuador and Chile, uh, in order for them to try and do away with the American um, forms of knowledge around journalism theory and practice, the coloniality theory. Colonialism has displaced many communities. And unfortunately, South Africa is one such community that has long been deprived of its um, um, uniqueness uh, because of the history of the past and also the type of educational systems that were developed by the, the, the colonizers and the fact that we remain subservient for decades, you know, for a lengthy period, we still continue to rely on these um, um, type of knowledge systems that was somehow imposed on us, which ultimately saw us doing away with our very own indigenous knowledge systems. So there's a need to recover and redefine and rearticulate the piece of knowledge in our academic work. So this theory, this theory argues that for us to gain recognition of the ways in which social struggles to be challenged and redefined, we need to be proactive, innovative in terms of content development to respond to the needs of our, the informational needs of our very own communities. So the GIS suggests that conceptual vocabularies of academy can be displaced and redefined with meanings that emerge from political practices, alternative forms of justice, and ways of living. Because this scholar argues that for as long as journalists do not have a clear understanding of what um, the colonial masters, the extent of the damage that colonial masters have done, not only on our educational systems, but also on our um, culture and also you know, social settings, the journalism, are, journalism, journalists are not going to be uh, good storytellers of the African knowledge systems. So the critical, the second theory is critical race theory, which involves the study of race, racism, and society as a whole. So this is critically important type of theory. And it's a theory that has extensively been used in, in the United States, in Korea, and in Spain, in trying to understand the nature of the type of journalism that the colonialism has developed, which is now being embraced and used to develop the current form of journalists who tell stories based on the Western-oriented journalistic news values and principle. So critical race theory can be used in critical journalism modules. University of Limpopo has recently undertook the quality improvement plan or curriculum review program. And as part of this uh, program, Professor Lesame and a team of colleagues developed a um, series of modules on critical theories of media. And the issue of in theories such as decoloniality are also part of that uh, very module on critical mass media theories, because she's exceptionally good in this, in this very area. So despite multiplicity of journalism programs in South Africa, they're still dependent on Western focus and developed content. There's still whiteness and the other in scholarship on journalism. And that unfortunately remains unchallenged. You must have heard yesterday when the two colleagues um, made a presentation here, Norma and Melita, they spoke about their experiences in the newsroom in terms of their race relations, 
Oh, two minutes. Okay. Okay, these are theories, ladies and gentlemen. Can I quickly run through to please uh, take uh, take us to the results? Slide thirteen. Otherwise, I'm not going to finish. We want to hear the we want to hear the results. Very interesting. Yes, these are the universities. So this was a desktop qualitative study. University of Stellenbosch module decolonizing journalism modules that are there. That's part of decolonization of journalism. Unfortunately, the, I could not get the modules on the uh, websites. Uh, the second one is the uh, Rhodes University. I could not get module, module descriptions, TUT. Luckily, I got module descriptions. They've got African language as part of their uh, journalism studies, VETS, no module description provided. You need to stop joining back, no module. Uh, descriptions as well, DUT, Zulu. Okay. Though this module did not necessarily, I mean, the description did not give much details in terms of how this Zulu language is going to, I mean, it's going to be used or it's going to be beneficial to students of journalism. Um, the last one is CPUT. They've got CLOSA as part of their journalism studies and they are doing that mainly to try and refine journalistic jargons. Can we move on to the findings quickly? You can have one minute of my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this study assumed that all sample universities, um, all sample universities have their journalism curricula on their website, but that was proven to be, that was proven not to be the case. So DUT and CPT of African languages as part of their journalism programs, and they're doing pretty well in that area. DUT of us African languages part of its journalism program, but the language appears to be for conversational purposes only and not for journalistic storytelling. And we could run to the okay, there are the findings. There's lack of community-oriented journalism curricula across universities in South Africa. Students are not thoroughly equipped with skills to give a voice to the voiceless. The universities are not satisfactorily developing students who will appreciate the positive role that media can play in redefining and reshaping marginalized voices. Students are not being adequately developed into future community-oriented journalists whose journalistic practices will challenge hegemony and empower subservient communities. The universities um, were found not to offer students the relevant practical skill to service future purveyors of solutions to social challenges. They seem to be taught to be obsessed with uh, negativities. Next, uh, the next slide, please. That should be the recommendations. Okay, on the recommendations, there's a need for development of decolonized journalism journalism curriculums. There's also a need to develop community-oriented journalism curriculums. Students need to be offered both theory of decolonized journalism and also necessary practical skills to enable them to give voice to the voiceless. The university should also start changing the mindsets of students, thereby ensuring the students appreciate the role that the news media can play in social development. The last slide on Recommendation, universities need to actually develop current students into future community-oriented journalists whose journalistic practice will change hegemony and power, I think there's a repetition. The last slide is on collusion. This study tried to draw three theories together, decolonial theory, critical race theory, Colorism in the higher education in South Africa with specific reference to journalism education. And arguably, journalism education plays a role in defining future journalists. And eventually, the way communities are reflected in the news reports through journalistic uh, practices. So, the last part is show the study material in journalism programs in country highlights that the content still remains grounded in theories, concepts, judgments of news and case studies within global 
not experiences. That should be the last one. If journalism is to address social justice and inequality, there's a need or necessity to educate journalism students about the impact on colonialism had on different communities in, in, in the country. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And we hand the floor over to Thank you. Don't open it yet for me, Colin, in a few minutes. Yes, there's some preambling that I didn't. I put some slides together this morning and I realized I probably should have um, <laughs> situated that slide in the beginning. So let's try it. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the experience around recurriculation. And it's something I really enjoy doing because I've got um, my own interests in curriculum, in higher education, in you know, how information is shared with students for their own learning, growth, development, skills, etc. And so when I got to Rhodes a few years ago, um, I was given the opportunity to work on a program, which I found very interesting. It's the history of the press, or it's a better term that she doesn't enjoy, or she's not yet, the history of the black press. Um, as part of print media history in the country. And I thought I had a good opportunity to, I mean, I don't like taking a, something and teaching it as, as, you know, you just, you've got to make sense of a program or a course for yourself and see how you can rethink the offering. And so that was really important to me was rethinking the offering. Um, and I've come up with a few principles that I thought I could share of how I, of how I personally go into rethinking a curriculum offering. So whether, I mean, a lot of times we inherit courses, right? We, we, there are courses that are embedded within the system. They are handed to us. Sometimes we have the opportunity to create our own courses. I also found this framework to be helpful for that. But I think especially when it comes to inherited courses, I needed to think about how do I make use of my own ways of knowledge making, knowledge dissemination, and critique to embed it within this particular course. The program, what I found, first of all, contextualization. Um, and I'll start from where does the program come from? It has to do with knowledge rates. So the program has been part of the journal curriculum for a long time. It's, I think, a very important course around presses, alternative press. Um, and what was important for me was to take that course and to contextualize its history and its present offering to students today. So I'm going to kind of skip between them. Um, the course comes from this is the 1984 curriculum manual taught by Les Switzer, who was the first head of department. It's got a picture of Sol Pleike on the front, and it's got the same poem that we've seen from Isaac Petropa, your cattle are gone, your countrymen, go rescue them, go rescue them. Leave the breech loader alone and turn to the pen, take the paper and ink, for that is your shield. Your rights are going, so pick up your pen. I think it's become kind of a theme of our colloquium in different spaces, right? And then once we open up this curriculum, thank you to Lynette for leaving it to me, by the way, I feel like I've really inherited a gem here. Once we open up this curriculum, um, we can see a little bit more about the kind of readings which informed the conversation of the day. And it starts with this idea of the Black Press in South Africa and Lesotho, which is a grounding canonical text written by Switzer many years ago around issues of the Black Press. Talks about dependency and then goes into an interesting shift. So obviously when I found the course, it looks a bit different, but I found it very important to go back to where do these ideas stem from? So I read a bit about Switzer's own background and Switzer was a theologian who worked at the school and who was a very resistance press oriented, you know, and wrote about the resistance press in the 1980s. Contextually, I cannot start there today with our students. We're not in the 1980s. Landscape has shifted dramatically in the last 50 years. 
from the time that these first courses were developed, from the time Black Press in Lesotho was written in 1979. <clears throat> and so how do we contextualize the importance of this offering for students today? Um, so eventually I'll share with you where we start and where we end, but a few of the principles. So one is context. What I loved about Les Switzer's journey is that when it started, he had an honor student who was interested in the first African language publications, Isitosa language publications in the Eastern Cape. Went and did an honor study and realized there was no information on this. And this is where the project of studying African language newspapers in the Eastern Cape region and in the country really began in this space and discovered that there's not a historical account of this information. The first African language press in the country on the continent started here in the Eastern Cape with um, Ushumaweli Wendaba being the very first publication. Um, and that these accounts of how these publications came about, first of all, is not really publicized. Studying the artifacts of what they represent for the time and what we can learn about them today really is not common practice. Um, and so using all of this information allowed me to contextualize the offering for students today. So, okay, so we're situating this learning in a long established history of the school around looking at resistance and black press. So Thomas Selly, for instance, contributes to this. There's different people who write about resistance presses, but even those conceptualizations are out of touch with where students are today. Les Switzer writes into the petty bourgeoisie and students didn't really appreciate having their ancestors being compared to the petty bourgeoisie of the time. It's something that really heinously upset them. And so it allowed me to kind of understand a little bit of where does this content come from? Vital, at the time, this was revolutionary. In the 1980s, nobody was studying this. Nobody was able to talk about this and read about it. But 30 years later, so where do we start? Um, very interesting course deals with Drum Magazine, deals with very important issues. Uh, but I find it's important to take inherited courses and, and re rethink them for with your own imagination for present student offerings. But the first thing I did was contextualization. Okay, we sit in present day, why do we need to do this? Um, why do we need to do this work? First of all, we cannot look to our current political leaders as the ideal possibility of where our thinking comes from. We've got to go further back. We've got to think back to forms of resistance whilst operating in maybe challenged colonial oppressive type spaces. And we just look at people who have done the work of giving us strong intellectual direction for not only resistance, but sense making and giving us a way to look forward. So contextualizing the need to do that for students today. Um, the issues of African language presses solved when we look back in history, context for students. So we don't maybe see as many diverse presses today. Why is that it existed? 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And when we look at various modes of um, oppression throughout these you know, periods, we see how this has been squashed by financial interests over time. A lot of this was already in the course. So for me, what I needed to think about was expanding the knowledge base, expanding the epistemology. How do we come to know what we know? How do we value this particular knowledge? And so what I offered students the possibility of was rooted in oral culture. And when we had a look at these early presses and even this African advertiser, so we look at different presses. We look at this African advertiser, we look at the, the first Dutch, the Afrikaans, what's it called? The Afrikaners, that Afrikaans paper. We look at um, Inbo Zaban Sundu later, we look at early, it's problematic. Eh? We look at some of the early publications and we can even access um, digital access to these particular archive papers. And, and we even have hard conversations about why there are certain papers that I choose not to have students look at the first two editions because it is so racist in its language usage that I feel like either I'm going to trigger people or I'm going to make this seem okay. But we talk about why it's available and if people really want to go and look at it, they can. 
but there's certain modes that we choose not to study just because it's problematic in itself. Um, but we have the difficult questions about why we've chosen to select certain texts. Um, we start with, first of all, I've had to look outside of the journal discipline because what the tools that we needed to have this conversation were not there. So I went into a book called Whose History Counts? And it's based on historians around the country talking about pre it's called a started a conference I went to, pre-catalytic conference about what happened prior to colonial expansion, you know, go back, go back, think about previously, how do we start rethinking about whose history counts? So we start from that point of view and then we talk about orality and oral culture. And we see in these early papers, different forms of storytelling. We see poetry, we see folklore, we see cultural stories, we see, yes, news reporting, political reporting, critical reporting, all of it but it's more layered and more textual. And we see many different cultural representations across language groups in these early papers. And I thought that was really important for us to examine. So I'm just going to, oh, I'm going to talk about why, maybe I should just go through the principles and then give you to how, how I've seen those experiments come into fruition. We move forward and I thought it was really important to link this history into what journalists are experiencing in the newsroom, not just today, but in their time in the newsrooms, operating in newsrooms historically. So what did newsrooms look like 150 years ago? Was there a newsroom? You know, was it at love there? Where, where are these newsrooms where this information is being produced? What were the kind of challenges around uh, freedom of expression? How were those navigated through? Um, and what can we learn about not only the kind of journalism that was produced, the production practices um, of how it was produced, but also how people were able to navigate those different um, moments to be able to produce information that in very often was challenging. So in many of the early papers, we see an English section and then we see an Isitosa section, or we see an English section and an Isizuzu section. And what was supposed to happen was the African language section was supposed to be a translation of the English section, and it's not at all. It speaks truth to power. It deals with issues of the colony. It deals with issues of oppression. It deals with poetry. It deals with storytelling. I mean, what Chope, even the, the issues that we see, many of the texts that are becoming foregrounded as important are published in early newspapers. And so these newspapers become a space of intersection for politics, for history, for news, for many areas of life. So besides just looking at it from a journalistic perspective, oh, and what I found interesting in expanding the canon, journalistic, we're not using our old texts. In histories, it's becoming core part of history syllabus to go back into newspapers and to find information. African languages are using literary components through these particular early newspapers to be able to have access to early storytelling, early language practices, etc. But it's not really being done within our own spaces, which I thought was interesting. So we need to look at journalists in the newsroom. We need to incorporate student voice in the curriculum. And there's different ways to do that, not just giving them to write an assignment. For this course, they write two assignments geared at the journalist. Uh, Zubeda Jaffa was one of the founders of the journalist. They've got stories about iconic figures. You can find Sol Pleike's life story there. You can find John Jababu's life story there. Who, by the way, the two of them were in constant, uh, they actually had a feud because John Jababu was not representing the issues of communities about the Land Act. And so Plyke challenged him publicly in newspapers and said, I will come to your place of where you live and we will debate this because you are not dealing with issues of land. The Land Act issues are in early newspapers, language issues in early newspapers. Everything we are seeing reproduced in conversation today, their early roots, we find them in these early language presses. So I found them useful for that reason. I've had to expand on theory by theorizing previous contexts and current contexts in which uh, media operate and incorporating that into history. And the reason why I've done that is for relevance. My biggest concern is that the decolonial project will lose the need to incorporate relevance. We cannot have it as, 
oh, so we're decolonizing over here and then we're doing journalism here. <laughs> or we, we're decolonizing here at the margin, but this is actually our core curriculum and this is a plus. We cannot ever get into that terrain because I find that it's sidelining. It's, then it becomes a tick box sideline exercise. Mm -hmm. And so what I've done with the history course now, it ends in last month's contribution of the continent as a looking at how does the print media shift? How does it move into digital terrain? How did we have to deal with COVID? What did that mean for our print media had to move online or close publications or look at retrenchments or find ways to survive? What was that survival mechanism and the move into digitalization? How has it speared through, through COVID-19? And where do we sit now? What kind of media products survive? Um, and so I think the relevance for students is, first of all, why? what does this matter to my life? Why do I need to know this? Do you give me an opportunity to think through my own positionality within this course that you are allowing me to experience? And how does it affect my final? I mean, I want to go into practice. So what does this have to do with where I move into? And so I find the knowledge, even in a history project, needs to really reflect present day experience because history is yesterday, right? History is what happened yesterday. It's what happened five minutes ago. It's history. So I just want to uh, show two possible experiments that I've used um, based on this kind of framework to give students an opportunity to, I'm out of time, so I just need to, I'm on borrowed time now, so let me go quickly. I'll give you a um, So the first one, thank you. So the first one, you're not even presenting, but thank you. So the first one is starting point. We start from historiography and the oral archive. Now, students write two assignments which they give for the journalist, which is modern day journalistic practice. And then they take one of those and they convert it into a long paper. They're complaining that I'm giving them too much work, but I said, who's going to do this work if you don't do it, okay? And then we convert that into a long paper. But one of what we've offered them to do is, and it's probably counts not point, like 1%, not even 1% of the entire year, maybe 0.05% of the entire year. Because Churchill was worried. How can I give these free writing exercises? I was like, well, if you go back to the history of early newspapers, poetry was a legitimate way of communicating and writing in early papers. So we give students to write a poem, free write a poem to their own oral experiences. And it was multilingual. We had Isizulu um, Zulu contributions, is it Kosa contributions, Afrikaans contributions, English contributions. And I had a team of tutors who understood different language groups. And between us, we would read the poems. We also had people who tried me and wrote poems about sex in other languages. Because I mean, it's university <laughs> students, right? But we filtered them out. Um, because <laughs> tutors would read them and I'd run each one through Google Translate. And we, between us, we kind of had a, a tutors are the most valuable resource we have around African languages and expanding um, our possibility to understand. So, and I'll just read one. So we've got Istosa contributions around um, pride, Istosa language and early orality and where that fits into thinking. Um, we've got somebody who writes in English about their grandmother's story and how she doesn't like to be interrupted and how this early, as her as a knowledge system in itself allows them to make sense of the world. Um, and then somebody writes about our history. Our history is told in the stories of great warriors, of great clans and great wars where our people conquered. Times have changed so that our messages go above the barriers. Our history is now told by our conquerors. The arrival of print began a new age. It brought about systems of change. Orality, our main source has now been taken by force. So one of the contributions we now use is oral archive as the first author of newspapers and what we can learn from that. Um, but thank you to Zubeda and Nomalanga because there are people who I consulted around how do we think about this early time and presenting it in the history of newspapers. Then the last one, I'm done after this, is this is where we end. Students want to know what is the point. We cannot decolonize, offer decolonial notions outside of the relevance of what they do. So we look at it, relevance of digital disruption in the news. We talk about where we are today in online news production, how that shifts from print, what that means for going forward. And we look at the continent as one offering, um, as a possible decolonial offering. I don't call it that, but we look at the continent as a digital mode that works via WhatsApp, is produced by the Mail and Guardian in collaboration with newsrooms around Africa and tells different stories. 
Um, and so trying to keep to the idea of relevance for current context. I think if we're not offering students re realistic information that is relevant, that is cutting edge, that is up to date, that affects the way they currently see the world and is aligned to their own way of thinking about the future as digital natives, we are going to lose them. Yeah, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Taryn. Without much ado, let us welcome Professor Carol Nassari for, her, for the last presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Colin. Um, I love my group. I think the presentations uh, are similar in many ways than one. But I would like to speak to the presentation that I sent to you, Colin, so that I do not forget uh, one or two items. Thank you. I think uh, having listened to these presentations today, there are many similarities in people's presentation, except that people use different, uh, different ways, maybe for a theory. Uh, but I think there's a lot one can pick up in terms of similarities and also uh, the future, how people see the future, there are similarities in that as well. Uh, to answer the question that was stated in the program, um, to curricula, uh, uh, curricula decolonized, my simple answer would be no. Uh, in, at the University of Limpopo, I think uh, Mixin uh, did mention, or let me decolonize that, Mankete did mention that um, we did a curriculum review. Yeah, because uh, when I saw the curriculum, first time I saw it, I, I thought it, it was a little bit out of, out of context, outdated, and also not offering students much. So, we, 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 we engaged in this vigorous uh, exercise of, uh, of, of, of recalculation. Hopefully that curriculum will see uh, the, 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 the documents of the university and the syllabus. We haven't seen it being introduced yet, but we are working on it. Uh, my presentation, <coughs> excuse me, uh, my my presentation is, is is not a lot, but I thought it would be nice to share what you are thinking uh, with other uh, scholars as well, and also listen to other scholars who are interested in the same uh, in the same uh, issues. So the first pages of that uh, are, are, are definitions of. Uh, but I would like to start uh, my focus on page four. Oh, journalism education has been defined. Uh, pretty much everybody knows what it is. It's what we impart to students so that they can participate uh, effectively in the journalism industry. Unfortunately, uh, as many of us uh, in this room have uh, alluded to today, most of what we teach in terms of, of what is in the syllabus is still very much Western content. Uh, whether you call it theory or, 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 or whatever is, is in there, it's is Western. So the challenge now we are facing is, is to uh, uh, change some of this uh, or introduce some Africanism in this uh, curriculum. Uh, historically speaking, I've always been a, a fan of decoloniality except that in those days, like my first book uh, that I wrote in 2005, the contents of that book has got uh, African uh, content by African academics. And the idea at that time was to uh, try and teach uh, African uh, content in what we teach. But apparently we, 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 we just did uh, those uh, activities and those uh, publications and we forgot about doing what we were preaching. So now we need to really do what we're preaching. And I like what Rose is doing uh, because it seems to be really, really decolonization 
in in sm in small but very significant ways, uh, introducing African languages and so on. Thank you, uh, Colin. Now these are the approaches that I, 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 I was thinking about in the few days that I looked at, at this. Uh, in the 80s and 70s, uh, uh, so South African journalism was very much constructive towards the development of society. Uh, I mentioned one example there, and I think that kind of journalism we have to revisit because our society is, is, has got a lot of challenges and problems that were not there in, 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 in the 80s and in 70s. Obviously, the focus was on, pol on political freedom and the struggle for freedom during those as part, uh, society had less problems uh, in terms of communities and, and, and uh, how people related to, to, to each other. But today, I think because uh, also journalism moved away for, from community building journalism, some of these problems uh, have also, so I, I, I suggest there is a need to move back to that kind of journalism. Just a couple of examples uh, in the in the 70s, there were people like. Uh, 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 let me start with the one on 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 the presentation. Nation building. Uh, Akri Klaas, there was the uh, editor of the Sowetan, and his writings really were to build mm -hmm. communities. Whatever topic he was uh, writing about in in the newspaper, uh, a community members had to learn something out of that to build their own communities. Uh, and the 70s, uh, I think the most uh, in, 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 in notable uh, uh, person uh, is, um, I forget his name, but he's, he's, he, he, the, 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 the Black West uh, surrounds uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, journalism. So, uh, uh, come again. Are you talking about Percy Cobos or Joe Cobos? Absolutely, Percy Cobos. And his name was right here. <laughs> but it went away like in a jiff. So I, I'm like, yes, but he is, he is, most of his writings were, 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 were for political awareness and also a struggle for, for freedom and achievement of, of human rights. But those kinds of journalism were very purposeful and aimed at building the lives of everyone in society. Uh, so today, I think that kind of journalism is upset. Of course, we see uh, some uh, small uh, 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 kinds of that journalism today, if somebody writes about gender-based violence, but I think uh, they are not consistent. Those kinds of, we, we, we need them to, to be grounded and, and firm and not ending, uh, they, are, they should not be periodical, they should uh, you know, be there all the time. The second type, I, I, I mentioned this yesterday, Ubuntu. Ubuntu is, many people talk about this, that's why I wrote there that, uh, you know, uh, Ubuntu is, is kind of like Vogue, everybody seems to be talking about it, but uh, not everybody practices its principles. Because if we were to practice the principles of which I think Sandra uh, explained some of them well, and I think the comment of today came from Rod, who said, my heart is your heart. I thought, mm -hmm. I've never heard that before, but I thought that was uh, uniquely uh, defined. But if we were to be aware of, of Ubuntu and practice what it teaches, we would really practice good journalism in society. There is kinds of journalism that have put Ubuntu uh, uh, values in them, forces developmental journalism, journalism to expose corruption and those types of journalism. But we need more of that because our society is, is, is in tatters right now. There are many things that are going wrong. Uh, you can also call this watchdog journalism, you know, the media is the fourth estate, but we need more as I write in the last journalism for good, we need that because uh, our country is a country that we don't recognize anymore because of the problems that exist, especially in 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 in, uh, in provinces like Hauden. Quite a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, next page, Colin. Thank you. 
One uh, approach that we, we, we think we should be more uh, emphatic about uh, in our new curricula that we, we teach, how we teach journalism is critical media the, uh, literacy. Most people in society uh, do not know how to uh, read and analyze media properly. Some people have, me have mentioned media literacy here. Uh, I think also in the first uh, session today, uh, the lady from Rhodes mentioned that, uh, that uh, so we really need to dig deep and uh, teach aspects of media literacy and include uh, that uh, course uh, in our in our future in our future work. Uh, Peladi Peladi was was the lady who mentioned it, but she's not the only one. I've seen I've heard about it uh, throughout the week in in in, in different sessions, but. Uh, some colleagues use different ways for it, but it's something that we have to read to do. And obviously languages will come in uh, very much in, in, into that. And fr from what I learned today is that uh, we need to emphasize multilingualism because in my mind, I was thinking about maybe one or two languages that we can uh, write in so that our students can uh, really learn how to write in this uh, in this uh, particular uh, languages and learn how to read media well. And uh, issues of uh, power and, and media owner aspects of media ownership and and, and, and content of media, uh, race uh, issues and, and representation issues. Most people are unable to really analyze these issues in the media and. If students are going to understand these uh, hectic matters of media, we, we have to uh, also explain them in our languages. I, re I remember in one class a uh, few years back at the University of Lupopo, one student in an honors class asked me to explain this, this issue I was talking about in Sibeti. And I said to my baby, I have no idea of Sibeti at all. So I have, unfortunately, I have to stick to English because that language that you want me to speak, I do not know. And I could understand because she couldn't understand what was being explained in English because of their minimal understanding of the English language. Uh, so there is a, a, a critical need for us. Uh, and I come back to this point. I, I, I really love what Rose is doing uh, because I also see a, a other languages in the journalism work that they, they do. And we are learning a lot from that uh, because I think that's the way uh, we should be going as well. Uh, uh, thank you, Colin. One other aspect I think we should in future put emphasis on is media ethics. Uh, some people have, have uh, mentioned that as well. There's a lot of types of ethics mentioned there. Uh, decency, for instance, is, is important in, in the content of media because I've seen a lot of uh, content in media today, even if it's a word uh, that is used in a particular story, uh, that sounds a little bit uh, indecent. So uh, we need to teach uh, uh, students uh, some of these aspects. Uh, for instance, public service broadcasting, mm -hmm. uh, aspects of stereotyping. There's still a lot of stereotyping uh, in media as well. And those aspects are, are really uh, un, African, uh, we, we, we didn't normally, we were not exposed to those kinds of things growing up. Uh, also to, 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 to report and, and, and write stories in public interest is very, <clears throat> is very important. So at the end of the day, we, we have to explain to students what public interest is in a way that they will be able to relate to and also understand. Uh, in South Africa today, it's got a, a lot of problems, abuse of children. So these are issues that we have to focus on. Uh, and, and most importantly, in traditional languages, because communities that uh, have these challenges, they, they don't use English, they don't use Afrikaans. Uh, there may be uh, communities, uh, like for instance, in the Western Cape, where these issues has happened, uh, where communities speak Africans, but it's important that we, we address these issues 
uh, in journalism that addresses the languages of those communities so that the people who we get those stories from understand the importance of why this, this problem should be addressed in community. So ethics is an is a, is a important uh, area that we should be focusing on. Uh, and I think somebody mentioned digital ethics and I'm all for that because uh, we use digital technology today. Uh, uh, page eight, is it calling? Uh, so many of the around me. I didn't hear. I didn't hear that. Sorry, two minutes to round up. The group is just not getting there. Yeah, I'm quick. At least I don't have 22 pages. Like, uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got 10. <laughs> Thank you for that. <clears throat> So this this page was just to uh, was just to portray what the, the, the methods that you, we will use in future now to teach these students. And I agree, I'm, I'm actually happy I, I joined this session because there were many other methods that I learned from colleagues here, uh, which I will also adopt and try to attempt to use because we have to use multimedia, we have to use uh, I, I added a narrative podcasting here because uh, I read in a few articles that in, in, in Canada and in Australia, it's very, very successful uh, uh, to use for students to produce journalism uh, projects. So I, I thought, let me throw in there. Uh, digital journalism, of course, multimedia journalism, we have to go there using different, uh, uh, whether you use Facebook or you use any other uh, methods, but that's the way that we have to go. And I'm all for that because uh, the young students, young generation that we teach use social media and, and much media. Uh, the issue of Net Nagasa was to emphasize that uh, the old uh, storytelling journalism that we used to enjoy in the past, the stories of people who are lights in our lives or people we can learn a lot from in terms of uh, living better lives. It, 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 it's very much missed that kind of thing. I wish you could come back because the, there are stories of people uh, from the past, uh, even from the present that we can learn from, even though in the present, these people are very few to, to, to find. But in the past, these people were really there and there were lights in our lives. So we need to, uh, moving to the last point, to create new journalism content. And this journalism content must uh, not uh, throw away everything Western in our curriculum because there's a lot of good in the Western content that we've always taught for many years. Uh, so we need to combine the good in that content and the good in African content to build new journalism content that is going to be also uplifting to us and uh, be very, very educational to students of today so that they know uh, all different uh, approaches to, to, to writing uh, stories and also to uh, sharing uh, information about their communities to the world. And I think the last page is a, is a thank you page. Uh, yes, the last one is a thank you page. Uh, I think for myself, uh, I'm gonna pursue this uh, project of decolonization of journalism studies. Did a lot of research before coming here, but uh, I'm going to pull up my socks moving into the future to make sure that we produce more knowledge on this issue to um, uh, with the main purpose of empowering our students to have better careers in future. And I hope that covers the two minutes. Thank you very much, colleagues, and thanks for everyone for an empowering uh, two days. I apologize for the first day, my network didn't allow me to go in, but past couple of days have been very, very welcome and uh, uplifting and informative. And thank you to Rose for having us. Thank you so much, Rose. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree that the last few days um, uh, have really been uplifting and inspiring these discussions we've been having. So we've had very interesting uh, presentations and I can see interconnections um, running through them with uh, Sandra Pichar talking to us about 
uh, that the fact that there's no consensus on what it means to decolonize and the idea of, you know, being mindful of other knowledge systems and interdependence. And it reminds me of this idea of conviviality and uh, according to Francis Nyamjo, incompleteness, which, which I, may, I may talk about later, then Africanized curricula and also uh, be mindful of the skills that we teach to, the skills that we teach our students, uh, which all the presenters have also uh, um, shared, uh, sort of multimedia learning. And of course, Mankete reminding us of multilingualism, multiculturalism, and race relations in, in communities of practice and the study materials that are used in journalism and media curriculum. Also, of course, from his findings, he did uh he did find that there are issues with decolonizing the curricula in, in, in many African, uh, in many South African universities, which is uh, a bit worrying, but that's why we are here to, to have this conversation and, and to learn and to grow. And then of course, uh, Tarin reminding us of the need for recurriculation and beginning from the history of the press, you know, that's where we begin and then contextualization and expanding the epistemology, incorporating lived experience, and also student-centered curriculum, which is very important, and, and also being relevant, remaining relevant in as much as we are drawing from our lived experience or local context, you know, being more also outward looking and relevant in, in, in a globalized um, and uh, dynamic world. So, and uh, sorry, and of course, the last presenter talking about the need to root uh, to reroute our journalism in nation building and social uh, social justice ideals, and also grounding it in in Ubuntuism, which all uh, the, the other presenters have mentioned, and reminding us about the need for information and media literacy. Including this in the curriculum is also important, and media ethics, and also multimedia engagement. So I just wanted to summarize this point just as a way of refreshing your memory and also to prompt you uh, to know um, what questions you have as we take a few minutes for Q&A, maybe, I don't know, between um, eight to 10 minutes. I know we are out of time and we're running behind schedule, but um, if you have questions, please. Uh, yes, we have one, two. You can take maybe three, one, two, any other person, and three. So we can begin with uh, okay. Dr. Jones. Mine are really three sort of separate comments. Uh, the first one, um, when I started working as a journalist, uh, which was an awfully long time ago, and I'd rather not specify. <laughs> Uh, but it was at the Mercury and then the Daily News in Durban. And I remember I was working as a political um, reporter, and I remember very clearly Les Switzer mm -hmm. at that stage working with Kian Thomas Ely quite a bit. And Kian and his little CCMS outfit pitched up the, at the Daily News and had an absolute go um, at all of us who were working there uh, about our terrible coverage and our lily livered behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> having based their research on information gathered from the staff, which wasn't terribly helpful in terms of being the province where the civil war was raging. Mm -hmm. However, um, they, uh, the, the point that I'm making, well, the two points really, let me make the first one. The point is that neither of them really had any idea about what it meant to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, they, don't, they didn't appreciate the reality. And I think that one of the things that we have to be really careful about is balancing our ideological uh, ideas and passions against the reality of the workplace. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately what we are doing is producing people with suitable skills um, to go into a workplace. And most of the time they're going to be working for people who pay them salaries. And if they can't do mm -hmm. what those people want them to do, then we are basically adding to the uh, to the unemployment figures in the country. So I do, I do think that, that we have to be quite strictly realistic about that. Um, yeah, 
And it's and it is very difficult in the modern day and age because it seems we're teaching journalism students more and more. There is more to teach them because of all the technological advances. <clears throat> but that's we've still got to keep in all the old stuff. Um, and we are, and I am going to be quite blunt here because I'm uh, discovering in my middle years that blunt is sometimes the best way to go. The standard of student that in particular that we are getting at UKZ. Uh, some people come to us and they are semi-literate uh, in all languages, not just in English, uh, which is a problem. What do we have to deal with? The second one is just going back to, to Les and Kian. <laughs> terribly sorry about this, but I have to because it's just interesting. Um, and there's been a lot of talk in the in the in this colloquium about the importance of history and the importance of memories and whose memories are important and why they're important <laughs> anyway. So, of course, it was inevitable when there's a lot of testosterone around, there is usually a butting of horns. And <laughs> this happened with Kian and with Les. And uh, in fact, Les, if I recall correctly, was one. Uh, now, when would this have been? There was a great exodus of white people. And I can't remember whether it was sort of late 80s, early 90s, I think. Anyway, Les was one of them. I think he's in New Zealand now. Just okay. thought I should um, point that out. But the point that I'm making is that people change over time. Um, people's views change. And I think another thing that we have to be quite wary of and cognizant of is that academia, just like anything else in the world, is influenced by trends. So I am writing about this paper and another one, which I'll mention shortly. Um, but the whole idea of trends is that sometimes it's very, at the moment, it's just very sexy to talk about decolonization. It just is. Um, that's where the money is for funding, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we have to be cognizant of this. And I think to the, come to the second paper, we have to be very aware. And I think that it's one of the things that we need to make students aware of as well. Um, is that multiple conflicting truths can exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I am I am writing about this fairly, so it might work mm -hmm. at some stage. Yeah. And then the third thing, um, just in terms of language, UKZN, I, I hate to punk the institution. I know it has all sorts of horrible faults. Um, but one of the one of I think one of the big things, and there was a lot of initial opposition towards it, and, and still is some hesitation in certain regards. But we do have a language policy. There are um, the undergraduate students of English is not your first language. You have to do a, a module or two in Sicilian, and that's compulsory as part of all degrees. Uh, Staff are encouraged to do learn SSD because they would really like to um, bring in bilingual teaching as soon as possible. Um, uh, they are developing, and I'm not quite sure what you'd call it, an academic lexicon, a dictionary. Yeah, uh, but it's it's yeah, it's uh, basically to try and get words in SSD which will allow students um, to be able to possibly understand the, the, the language and write fully in their own languages because we are allowing um, students at master's and PhD level to write in, in SESULI. And uh, when we have tutors, which is not very often, <laughs> sometimes they're just you know forgotten about <clears throat> by the powers that be. It's one of the ways in journalism, obviously, is to help people um, and be able to mark mark their work. Um, Google Translate is not always the best. Um, uh, the, the only other thing that I'd, I'd like to say now for people who don't have these sorts of language policies, and I think it's very important to, to bear in mind for the future, and it's a big mistake, in my opinion, that our university made. Um, in the, uh, prior to, well, prior to uh, the big Willie regime, <laughs> sorry, I can't believe I said Which that. Um, that? <laughs> all of them. <laughs> uh, you were able to, I'm so sorry, yeah, did, that you have to be cut out. <laughs> <laughs> if you were a, a second language, um, this is Zulu speaker, you used to be able to major in Zulu as a second language. And some of South Africa's foremost scholars 
um, I'm thinking of, of Adrian Koopman, who has published extensively in terms of um, city plants, and I think he's just done a book on, on birds and those kinds of things. I mean, it's really great stuff, but it's going to prevent that sort of thing happening again. And I would encourage people who are going to introduce languages, um, other, other, other institutions, to keep those, those um, second language majors there because, oh, that's important, you know. Um, for the future of the country, etc. And just a point about oral accounts. Uh, a lot of what is said in Parliament, in its province and national level, well, everything theoretically is recorded in Hansard. Um, hopefully, they're still in Hansard, and that would also be a fantastic archive. But thank you. I mean, it's been it's been a great colloquium, and I've learned a lot. And, I have a terrible sense of humor, so. Uh, so for Karen, um, he said we need to, you know, make a push to incorporate student voices in curriculum. Um, how do we do that? Have you tried it on how it works? If we're talking about student voices beyond assessment. Can I? Yeah, I'll take yeah, no, I'm saying I've got an answer to that just now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm just asking about um, um, this vogue of a very kumbaya um, view of Ubuntu that um, is devoid of um, the, the need to challenge hegemonies and the structural economic inequalities in our country and um, the choice that poor people can make to, 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 to embark on different forms of adversarial struggle upon um, you know, the powers that be in order to, 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 to get their basic rights and needs met in the society. So um, I think it's, a, it's something that is, um, you know, it's 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 often very prescriptively wielded in in academic circles, and um, it's probably quite far. There's a chasm between it and the lived experiences of people who struggle, and that our journalists that we prepare are actually going to encounter a lot of social conflict mm -hmm. and a lot of um, social unraveling mm -hmm. and a lot of violence out there, mm -hmm. and yet um, be groomed in this you know, nice kumbaya thing going on. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical about it and I hope I'm wrong. Do we have any other questions so that we know that when the panelists uh, take the question, that would be the last because we need to wrap up. Do we have any other? My question will be to Monkete, just a quick one. Um, are there other variables, Um, I don't know, the, yeah, variables that you looked at uh, when you studied those universities, apart from language and community-based uh, media practice in their curriculum. Oh, 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 thanks for the question. Okay, so yeah, you can begin. Okay. Yeah. No, no, unfortunately, I just looked at the at the language. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the language. Yeah, the language. The reason why I looked at the language is simply because at University of Kumbogo, um, I'm planning that next day we should have a multilingual newspaper or news magazine oh. um courtesy of our journalism students oh. because in Yosef in Popo or the province in Popo has got three ethnicities Venda, Batonga mm -hmm. and the Bedis. So and the university uses the name Sobenga as um, as a residential mm -hmm. address. So Sobenga's the SO there stands for SOTU, V there stands for Venda, uh, you know, NG there stands for NGA for Tonga. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that when we, when, you know, when you embark on this process or on this project, it becomes a successful project and uh, it gets the support of the management. Thus far, they have okayed it to say, well, it's fine in a way, it's going to reflect or you know, uh, promote their relevance mm -hmm. in this uh, whole debate around decoloniality, not only in journalism, but decoloniality in, 
in um, in the in the entire you know university curriculum. Yeah. Thank you. Sandra and Tarin, do you want to jump in? Yeah, can I can talk to Tendeka and then sort of lead them to um yours. But I mean I completely agree with you. It is a very kumbaya, but the 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 thing is is that it's just a perspective to inform students. This is something that people are talking about. We don't want to sideline these ideas. I mean, and it's the same with all ethical frameworks. They are all on paper, they look fantastic, but in real life they don't work out that way. Um, and I mean, if you if you think about things like just the sort of utilitarianism of, of media ethics, where it's like, I'm going to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Well, well who decides that? Um, it's, it's very easy on paper to work that out, but we don't actually know where it's going to go. We don't know the situation the journalist is going to be in. So it's, it's sort of to teach them, this is kind of what underpins the practice, and then teach them that it's not going to be like that in the real world, as, as Nikki said, but it's sort of, so, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. And I, one of the things that does come that sort of I've spoken about um, with, with my work in terms of Ubuntu and Africanization is that we need to get rid of this sort of image in our head of this sort of utopia, that it was a utopia, it was all perfect, it wasn't messy, it was messy. Um, and just like all cultures and all societies, it's about kind of weighing and balancing these different moral frameworks and sort of fitting and getting it to fit and getting it to change as society and cultures change over time and integrating to other things. Um, I hope that, that sort of addresses addresses you. But I mean, I, I can't I can't agree more with you. I do think, and I do think that it's used very badly a lot of a, a lot of times when people use the term Ubuntu. It's a very very narrow and prescriptive way of, of looking at it. And I mean, one of the things that that I've studied um, was how Zapiro so when um, uh, did a lot of things with Jacob Zuma when they did that great Lady Justice. And one of the big things was, oh, this is attacking his dignity and it's against Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And actually it's not, because the reality is, is that if, if, if you're looking at it from that perspective, Zuma is a representative of the people. And to, well, it, it, well <laughs> he still is. Um, but it's that thing of if people, it, it, it's an attack on the community. It's not just attack on him as an individual. Dignity is a very individualistic way of looking at it. Wintu is about community. And so if you're attacking Zuma, um, you sort of attack, attacking the community and the community then decide, is this good behavior by my politician or my, my elder? If they say, actually, no, we need to bring him in and he, we need to, to question that, um, the community then decides whether or not this is good or bad behavior. Um, so I mean, there, there are these questions, and I think I think that's what it goes back to is understanding that it's it's not about the individual, um, and we can't just apply it as it suits an individual. We've got to look at it how it suits community. And again, that's very idealistic. Um, I'm not I'm not denying that in, in any sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, and then you asking how do we actually? Well, from my experience, and again, something I didn't get to because I got con distracted <laughs> with the theory, but. Um, one of the things that that we do in, in our courses is that we actually ask students at the beginning of, of a course, obviously the key theoretics are there and the, the core curriculum is there, but we ask students, well, what if, so we're going to be studying whatever. What authors would you like to inform this section? What television programs, what radio broadcasts do you want to study? Um, so and every year we adapt that. So I teach television studies, and every year at the beginning of the semester I say, "What are you guys interested in?" It's a lot of work for me because now I've got to go and find those programs. Not always successfully, but I update it like that. Um, and it's the same with June. Which authors here, or we give them a selection. These are the people that we're doing. Um, if and in June as well, before COVID, would offer up. Okay, you, there is a practical component at our honors level. You have a choice. Do you want to create an online magazine? Do you want to create um, a newspaper, a print newspaper? Do you want to create infographics and go into that type of multimedia? How do you want to? How do you want to do this? And we give them. So we teach them other skills, but the main projects we actually say, well, you tell us what you feel is important. Um, obviously, we don't let them have free reign. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think I think that's the thing, and I think it's about providing students the agency to convert their skills um, into a voice. Um, I think that's that's the thing. And I think it's also, we've got to try and almost deprogram our students when they get to, to university, that mm -hmm. it's not about rote learning. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's about you actually can you can question you can challenge us it's this, this is that's what it's about it's not just I'm the authority you must listen to me I want yeah so partnership and as students at least in my curriculum the highest students get in their studies um, and by the time they get to to honors I start saying you are now a peer you're a colleague um, so now we're going to start working like colleagues um, I'm not there to to baby you I'm there to to kind of guide you, um, but I'm not there to make the decisions. I'm not there to drive drive your education. That's your that's your job. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it's <laughs> to give. No, I agree. It's useful mm -hmm. to give students choice. Um, I am a Freirean scholar, so I've studied Paolo Freire's way of thinking about pedagogy in the classroom, pedagogy of the oppressed, and humanizing pedagogy. So very often it deals with difficult questions and giving students difficult questions to think through in terms of curriculum, what it is we're studying. Um, and, and I think that framework is really helpful because it means that it can be applied across the board. So I think Freudian opportunities um, around dealing in classrooms with difficult questions has been useful for me pedagogically. And then it depends on, on for me, so I'm actually a media accountability scholar as well. So I've, I, you know, this thing of hybridity we were speaking about the other day, that mixing and matching ways. So sometimes I'll use a case study method. Sometimes I'll use the Harvard method where we build, ask a question and everyone builds, you know, on the answer. But then I've already got the answer and we'll get there. But if you don't get there, well, why didn't we get there? Um, so I think it's there's different ways of doing it, but... A, like having students come to the answer and then we work through it. But also depends on me because I, I'm on the media studies side. So we're doing a lot of the analysis of versus the media production side. And there are lots of overlaps um, between those two spaces. But I think it's the, you know, it depends on where you're situated, how that, that works through. But I think it's important. And even like, because I have the facilitation like in previous lives. So giving students questions and they can then work together, you know, and it takes five minutes. Here we go, do a, three, do a three pair share exercise. Two of you work together, come to an answer, and then we'll talk about the answer. And then you, you know, reflect or, but just ways of having it not be, because I think the university is a very colonial model in itself where somebody stands here and talk at you, and then you take that information, you do something with it. But looking at a different method of kind of, yeah, I think God forever, I just leave it there. <laughs> um, I don't know if Zandi has uh, something to add, if there's any other questions that speak to her. She uh, Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. I just wanted to say that, um, uh, when we, I mean, this, this this particular conference was focusing on decolonization of curricula, but generally, some of the curricula that we teach, we do we, we do not uh, save students from the realities of newsrooms at all because uh, we've worked in this uh, in newsroom, so we do uh, share with them the realities of the newsroom. We, we address issues like patriarchy in, in newsrooms. We do uh, address issues of racism. We do address issues of uh, misogyny. So we do touch the realities of, of the real world. However, we think uh, we, we should also prepare them about how to uh, react to those situations because it's important. I like the the, the lady who, 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 who spoke. Um, who I say? I think she said she was a journalist. That it, we should also prepare them not to 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 become, but if they're in the industry, because there's a chance of losing jobs if certain language, for instance, is used or if stories are written uh, in certain in certain approaches. So I think uh, what we would like them to understand, students, is that. You, you should be aware of all these uh, ups and downs and also uh, 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 quandaries that you will find in, in, in the industry. But we are trying to also offer them, uh, you know, understand 
understanding ways of dealing with the uh, challenges that they will approach. But we absolutely uh, uh, share with them the, the difficulties of the industry and the challenges that they will, and also a uh, ways uh, that they can use or approaches that they can use that will uh, alleviate further challenges for them in the industry. So that, that, that is how I see it. In fact, that is how I approach uh, my, my classes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone, the panelists and the audience for, for this wonderful session. There's, I don't think there's any more um, thing that I can add, but uh, we can draw the session to a close and let Jen uh, take the, the, uh, the final or the closing um, exercise from here. Thank you. Um, we, earlier this year, we had the colloquium um, that we called Journalism under Pressure, in which we talked about problems and the challenges that journalists face, and how one creates resilience and support for, for journalists, journalistic practitioners, I suppose. Where we focused on in this one was this notion of decolonial practices, so practices of teaching, practices of research, practices of journalistic practice. Um, and in the last one, the one that we now need to go to our deemed fundraise for, for um, early next year, our thinking there is to have a, a colloquium that deals with, um, with students, where students are the ones who speak and where there's space to talk about their involvement in these conversations. Um, we'd like to um, make a, a strong focus on student media and the, re, the, the reinvigoration of student media and the role that student media has to play as part of the media ecology of any institution of learning that concerns itself with journalism and media um, as an important space to learn. Um, our own experience in the, in the history of this university has been that student media has been one of the key spaces of learning for our own students, not just our classrooms, but our classrooms in combination with those spaces. Student media, I also think entrepreneurship um, and um, the ways in which young people are needing to create spaces for themselves for media practice outside the corporate corporate spaces when they leave universities and, and freelancing and those sorts of things. So that's for February. So there will be another time when we can reconvene then. Um, but while we are here in this moment to talk about decolonial practice, um, let's find a way of finishing that conversation in a satisfying way. So we started off um, at the beginning of, of, of our meeting here talking about where people locate themselves in relation to the debate about the tool of the master and its ability to be um, taken ownership of to, for the purposes of revolution and, and liberation. Um, and I think many of these themes have, have stayed with us over the past two days. Um, who is the master anyway? That's certainly one that, that came up a lot, the idea of what do you use the tools for? That being another one that's been absolutely key. Um, so, so I think this is some this is a good capturing of, of many of our thinking. But I would, I'd like to ask you a different question now, um, as the final thing we do today, um, which is what would you like? To, what what is it that you want to remember about the last two and a half days when you go home? What is the, where is there been something that has made you feel inspired? That has made you feel reawakened in what you want to do? Um, um, in, in this next year, taken away from, from the discussions we've had at this meeting. So I don't know if I can put you on this spot, Nicola, as a starting point since you're sitting right next to me. And then we take it from there. Yeah, I, I think I would probably say at the uh, importance of histories. Or histories. But resonates with me really powerfully. We we we, we repeatedly <laughs> come back in our curriculum discussions to like, what do we have space to teach our students about? Um, and for me, that certainly has been a key part of this this discussion is the re reaffirmation of the importance of history as part of the curriculum. Yeah. I think it's it's the appreciation of the messiness of the whole of all of us. Mm -hmm. That would be my takeaway. It's, and I think that's kind of exciting. It means that it's something that can still develop. It's not something that's set in stone. Mm -hmm. So that, that I think would be my 
Sorry. It's me collaborating with people in the know. And so to do that, I'm going to read Zubaydah's contribution because she had to be instead of my own visitors. Um, we need to study this in illusion. Oh, sorry. There's one contribution I want to make. The art of communication and writing has developed over millions of years and does not belong only to the North. We need to study this evolution and consider what elements we want to amplify and what serves us good. I want to create a beautifully crafted table. I cannot start with carving the legs of the table. I first need to know how to build the table and to make sure the legs are in balance, the top well sanded and functionally well constructed. We draw on the basic tools of writing a new story and learning to write it quickly. Perhaps we adjust those tools in some way, but they are useful and must first be practiced. I found this training enormously helpful and when I eventually went on to write in books. I knew how to write on deadline and establishing the facts. Then we need to learn the art of different kinds of communication and writing. It is our style that can be studied in the writing of soul writing. We have extensive radio archives that we can select from too. Then we need to understand the styles of other countries. We must study Gabriel Marquez of Latin America and understand the different styles of the persons and the worlds they come from. We cannot confine to British and American styles. We need to understand the formula and not just this formula, but the formulas that the drum writers follow. Okay, I'm trying to capture some of that. Um, so writing tools, acknowledging their long and very diverse history and the many resources and sources we can draw on when we teach our students about that, not just from the North, but from, but the, from the globe. the importance of focusing on that. And focusing on that, not losing the importance of that. Yeah. Focus on this. And for yourself, Taryn. Oh, the importance of the language. Oh, yes. Okay. So that's, I, I have a lot of people in the notion of It's okay not to know. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. That's fine. Good. So collaborating with others who know different things. Right? Finding different sources of knowledge outside of what we know. Outside of what we know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems to me a, a very important part. I mean, something that struck me. Um, yesterday morning when Jeff was here is he's with us here on, our, on this campus and he, uh, and he has a whole other world that he knows from in terms of his, the history, discipline of history. And there's so few times that we actually connect with each other to talk across those world, worlds of knowledge, even just in this space. I think that's true for, for us here as a group of people who come together from different spaces as well. Is There's so much more that we could do if we found ways of staying connected with each other to, to talk and, and collaborate. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. I get this hard drive from Simon. So, so one of the conditions that I accepted the invitation. I'm joking. Was I, I messaged Colin to basically say I was incredibly insecure. I didn't feel that I had none. Could I come as an observer and just to learn? And it's been absolutely awesome and incredible what I've learned, not only just in terms of the colleagues at the different institutions in here, but um, I, I, I really feel now that um, I've, I've, I've looked the giants in the eye and I know which tone I'm going to start nibbling on. So, and, and also just to know what, what's kind of doing what and where. So that's been amazing for me. The other thing that I think is absolutely brilliant is um, what you guys are doing as a department. The, of course, you, you're creating these colloquiums and a couple of other things right through the year that are bringing us all together, which never happened before, as long as I can remember. I mean, I never knew you existed with your smoking bad habits and all these kind of things <laughs> and your big willies. <laughs> so, I just want to, so I just want to say thank you for that, too. And if we can continue this dialogue, um, I think it would be absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. So continue the dialogue. Yes, and, 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 and build on it. Um, yeah. I think that's an important point. Is, I mean, we are the continuity. The continuity is important, but we mustn't start the conversation from scratch away, but pick it from up from here and yes. take it and, and joint research projects. So, uh, for example, I'm so clearly understanding that your students are so utterly and completely different to mine. Um, uh, yeah, and just the the sort of um, the middle ground there that I 
I think I could learn so much from you. So thank you. So that goes back to Karen's point. This being from different spaces is an important because mm -hmm. there's, there's value in comparison, I suppose. Yes, yeah. absolutely. All right. No. Mm -hmm. I don't mind quite left to the histories one. I think um, the importance of in practice looking to the ways we used to do things and taking mm -hmm. or looking at them as being just as valuable in this new we find ourselves in and trying to marry the two if possible. Um, that's something we're keen to. Okay, so revisiting past practice and linking to the present. Yeah. Uh, to present practice. Mm -hmm. uh, in a critical way is what Karen was saying. Excuse me. Um, I think mine would be keeping in mind uh, that our goal should be towards a truly healthy and ethical decoloniality or decolonization. I think it's important for us to not forget that we are doing this to, to make the world a better place, to be better humans and not just for the sake of it. So the idea of being transformative, but also progressive, globalized, but locally grounded, and for just better and more meaningful work in our field, and also to affect our society and communities of practice. Yeah. So the importance of, of, of purpose, the purpose of decolonization and the purpose mm -hmm. of the digital, digital world. Thank you. Um, two things. Uh, one is, I suppose it's a surrendering of power or a, or a partnering with students in the classroom, creating that egalitarian space. I think that's, uh, I think the, Decolonial. It can't happen without that, actually. So the, a power walk. the other point is just picking up on Tandeka's point about the importance of documentary, long form and in-depth mm. um, journalism that would, that is absolutely fundamental. Okay. So somebody also said it yesterday, they said not just reporting, but journalism. Um, Subeda. It was that Subeda. Okay. So um, documentaries, documentary production, long form, deep. And grounded, I suppose. Long form, deep, grounded storytelling. Yeah. Okay. Jimmy. Um, two things I've learned sitting in. This is a thing here. Uh, first thing I wanted to say is um expand the communities of practice if you can. You're talking about collaborating with each other, but you're all German departments. Mm. So expand into other transdisciplinary spaces. Anthropology is doing this work on this campus. Um, psychology probably is. Uh, we're still operating in silos if you're only just talking yeah. interdepartmentally. Yeah. So let's talk. I think that book I brought, I'm handing around mm. to people, that, that is an anthropological mm. study. Mm. Um, sciences are doing it. Let's go that way. Also, um, Pilates one. Just suddenly realizing the digital space is only in the hands of the master if you let it. It's it hasn't arisen from the 1700s, the 1800s. It's now you can grab that space, and make it your own, and don't be terrified the way I am of the trolls and the bots because they are not the masters; they're just the noise. So I loved your speech. So get into that digital space. That's the place where subversive and queer can happen, and that's what's needed. Queer and subversive. That was what I took. Thanks. Um, this first point that you made, I just I see the connection to what Prof Kupe said on on Wednesday evening about um, a transdisciplinariness. I took yes. four pages of notes. Thank you. He was fantastic. He was. Yeah. <laughs> um, mine relates to two points that have been mentioned already: the importance of history. Uh, past and the present, I think I relate more to those because I think if we, most of the young people, speaking for the young people, um, we do not understand the importance of our history in terms of how we represent ourselves in these spaces. Um, I think if we can, you know, understand what our history means in terms of um, our representation as Black young people, um, in these spaces, especially in the digital spaces. Um, most of the time, these spaces um, really um, 
how do I put it, they um, reduce us into adapting to what we find in those spaces without actually realizing that we have our own history and our own way of doing things which represents us as, as, as young Black people. So I think um, throughout the three days, I really uh, found how important it is to understand our own histories. Okay. So there's a link here between the understanding of history and this point about not just assimilating. When people have been speaking a lot about, about the difference between, I mean, Zubaira also spoke about not just reacting, but finding your own foundations from which you start. Mm -hmm. So that, that links to the point about history as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mine, I think, is around history. The importance of history. I, for one, do not, you know, pay special attention or more emphasis on the importance of African language, the importance of African language newspaper. African language. Can I say African language journalism? Yeah, oh, yes. African language journalism. Important. Yeah. Okay. Um, I learned three things. The first one is similar to Mass is that um, the the new the new opportunities both for um, growth and development and for reshaping um, continental narratives and approaches to decolonize our spaces um, lie in the in seizing the digital tools. So. Um, the opportunities of computational linguistics to deal with our language deficits are enormous. And um, I'll share those and learn those side by side with my students. The ways of um, excavating histories by using AI and um, anthropology um, and um, telling old stories like Long Mouse's story in a new way using um, decolonial approaches is um, another way of um, bringing all histories into an AI form. And um, also I, I plan to, to actively learn with my students about um, how to do that and landing it in the curriculum. Um, also, I learned that it is more important than ever to your point, never to teach away from communities of practice, because that shortchanges students. And um, if they learn in isolation from the technologies that are emergent, and that um, to find um, communities of practice in industry and in academia and in other subjects to Taiwan, in, in, in other disciplines, to Taiwan's point, and to forge and create um, institutions, new institutions of collaboration and co-production. And um, to Pete's point, production, production, studios, um, documentaries, books, um, podcasts, new forms of, um, of products that um, will make us um, vindicate our prolific history during um, that the, the founders of the, the black press or um, the alternative press in the 1980s. Um, that's one lesson we mustn't lose, to work hard, to be productive. The last one is um, ethics matter. And um, in terms of um, ethics, new digital ethics need to be crafted. Ethics that respond to and confront hegemonies and Northern dominance and um, anti-racism, creating spaces that don't center whiteness and um, Northern ways of being, being accommodative um, in terms of um, the, the, the disability thing, the need for our students, not only to learn PASA, but to learn SASL and all the other languages of communicating with disabled people and um, the kind of policy work that we need to do as a department, as an academy, and as a country on um, creating bridges of understanding with disabled communities and communities that have been othered to bring people closer. And that can be done through the adoption and the living of new values and sharing those with the, the students. The importance of new glossaries to have glossaries of new 
um, intellectual concepts and <laughs> old ones, and to deliver these in in indigenous languages, joining the glossary projects, joining the digital justice movements, and actually being active in the new year in all those projects. Um, I think I wanna just speak towards uh, or to collaborating with others outside of what we know. Uh, it's not just your your colleagues and stuff, it's also your students. Um, so yeah, students know a lot. They aren't just empty vessels. Um, I mean, this is what I've learned. <laughs> just, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I seriously think like uh, that's, uh, that's a valuable, re students are a valuable resource to develop a uh, curricula. Uh, that goes back to my point about Jacob. the people right around you that are not being drawn into the process in that mm. and have a lot of the students goes back to my point about surrendering power. It's that system mm. that's yes, that's what I'm talking about. And I love Sanders ask the students to to contribute to what they want to study. I mean, how phenomenal is that? That's amazing. Yeah. And John, yours, and you. I've got another right point. Under. Josh, I have another point. Sorry, I just have one more point, and this is what we were speaking about this morning about the the power of the periphery. Um, and uh, there was a, I just like uh, I don't know, I was thinking about where we gain leverage from, and it's not from like if we think about okay, pulling down a statue. We don't pull it down by standing underneath it or at the center of it. We pull it down by standing further away from the from the outsider's space. Um, so, yeah, like that's where the power lies. That's where we can uh, draw on resources that we might not have thought about before. And yeah, that's why I, made, I wanted to make this point because the power is in the periphery. We are all peripheral. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a crucial point. Now, Josh. Um, for me, one thing that's well, a lot of things stood out, but one thing that stood out to me, um, top of my list was something that you mentioned in this production, production, production. For me, being a third year student, getting ready to go into the real world, and taking all of those things into concept and kind of realizing how the real world really is. Um. The question is, how am I going to go and bring all this information and use it? You know, that's production. I think that's the main thing is just production, production, production. And like you mentioned earlier today in regards to Twitter um, and using platforms like that, especially digital platforms, that are, it's where we're all on at the moment. Um, there's a way to bring journalism into that. Although it seems like the young people aren't necessarily aware of what's going on, I do think there's a way to, you know, um, educate as well as put out information and knowledge through that sort of field. And I, it's not something that has been done yet, but I do think that we can do that through production in the digital space. So production in the digital space. Yeah. Go, Josh. Why that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's a good way to bring young people into the center, I suppose, as well. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Zandi, from you. Uh, thank you, thank you. I think we've uh, alluded to most of the the wish list that we have uh, going forward. Um, for me, I think in addition to uh, driving or writing and teaching students about decolonizing journalism. Uh, there's a need to also promote subjects in journalism that uh, are troubling our society, abuse of women and cyberspace. So we have to drive uh, approaches such as cyber feminism and new specific case studies that are going to address these issues because women uh, have got this burden of uh, abuse uh, on cyberspace. So we have to educate uh, our students about how to address these issues. 
And if you do teach about a uh, cyber fantasy, you cyber fantasy, you drive it home. Practical examples of how they can uh, protect themselves uh, on cyberspace and how they can deal with those solutions so that we continue to practice and also teach uh, aspects of good uh, journalism. I'm a very much a supporter of good journalism. So while I I'm busy Africanizing the content, I will also promote a, a good journalism because I think that is what can unite uh, this particular industry. Uh, I think bad journalism and issues of that nature will not enhance the quality of, of, the, of the field. So that, that, that is uh, how I'm gonna go about it. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's that's very really important. This idea of specialized areas of journalism that resonate with current social issues and that give students enable students in terms of solution based journalism. Okay. Um, have we finished everybody? Has everybody in the room spoken? Uh, no. But, uh, it's, it's <laughs> As a part of the um, <laughs> I think that um, I don't know if there's anything else that I would add to this. Um, uh, I, I, I suppose I'm particularly interested in this this production one. And I mean, Josh, I'd like to see what you do next year we, when you stay with us for fourth year. Yeah. Uh, to be part of that process. I um, like that. Yeah. So I suppose that's that's what I feel particularly excited by is the generation of. Um, of knowledge from the periphery, both in, the, in terms of storytelling, uh, long, deep, what was the other word you used? Grounded storytelling, um, but also in, in, in academic contexts, the, the same kind of storytelling that happens from there. In the okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, I really enjoyed the past three days, and um, I suppose this is a moment to say thanks for, for being here with us.